heifers are born or created or would come into the earth, that it was a sign that there should be, hallelujah, the second coming of, or the coming of the Messiah. So we see in this, we see just an incredible picture right now in the Middle East, just because not only in the Middle East, but here in the United States, these red heifers were born. Now these red heifers had to be uh, used in the early sacrifices to purify the temple in case there was anything uh, that was impure in the temple. So when we look today of these red heifers being born in our time, literally within 2,000 years, there has not been a red heifer born in the entire earth. And now we have farms filled with them. Literally just within the last 10 years, these red heifers have begun to be uh, multiplying uh, and it's a sign to the rabbis, it's a sign to the Jews that it's time for the coming of the Messiah. But what does that mean to us as Christians? Literally, you and I are in a season that those red heifers, one, they are symbolic of the coming of Messiah. It's very interesting that in the Talmud, the rabbis say that Solomon, with all of his wisdom, with all of his learnedness, and, and everything that he understood, everything that he knew, that Solomon could not understand the sacrifice of the red heifer. But literally because of uh, the sacrifice of that red heifer, we begin to see the coming of Messiah, the coming of Jesus. It is a beautiful uh, symbolic metaphor of what Jesus did 2,000 years ago. But why today? Is it symbolic of the second coming of the Lord? Or is it really symbolic of the bride, the sons of God coming forward? You know, the scripture tells us that all creation yearns for the manifestation of the sons of God. So we begin to see and get a, a real revelation that God is now birthing these red heifers into the earth because I believe that the, the likeness, the fullness, and the glory of God that was in Jesus is getting ready to come into his church, getting ready to come into his people. The interesting, uh, another interesting thing also about uh, the birth of these red heifers that literally two of them were born on Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is the Feast of Trumpets. It's literally, the rabbis call it the beginning of the world, uh, the beginning of the new creation. Literally, they also believe uh, that in the New Testament, when we talk about the trumpets uh, of the book of Revelation, those are all um, around the Feast of Rosh Hashanah and things being released for the second coming of the Lord. So now we again get this beautiful, beautiful picture of the second coming of the Lord. You know, uh, there's two rain seasons in Israel. One's the early rain, one's the latter rain. You've heard me talk about this before. The early rain was Passover, first fruits, unleavened bread, and Pentecost. Passover, Jesus was crucified. First fruits, he was resurrected from the dead. And Pentecost, he birthed the church. So clearly in the early rains, we see the first coming. So if the early rains are all about the first coming, then obviously the latter rain has to be about the second coming. In the latter rain feast, we have the Feast of Trumpets, we have the Feast of Atonement, we have the Feast of Tabernacles. So in those feasts, again, we see a beautiful picture of the book of Revelation. John hears the voices of trumpets speaking. Then you have the seven trumpets. In the middle, you have the Feast of Atonement in the book of Revelation. And the book of Revelation ends with, now the tabernacle of God is with men. So you see, again, those second coming feasts, all that telling us that God is giving us a revelation of his first and second coming. So clearly, everything happened on the exact time frames in those early rain feasts. As a matter of fact, everything in the Bible, all the way from Genesis chapter 1 in the beginning, the rabbis teach that when you look at that word, Bereshit, it also speaks about Rosh Hashanah. Uh, which means in the beginning, on the Feast of Rosh Hashanah, God began to create the heavens and the earth. They began to trumpet a message, and those seven messages were the seven days of creation. Again, that's the begin that was the beginning, but now we go to the book of Revelation. We have seven more trumpets in the book of Revelation. Uh, the book of Psalms says that we, if you want to understand the end, you've got to go back to the beginning. So you see the sevens in Genesis, and there you see the sevens again. The seven trumpets in the book of Genesis, seven trumpets in the book of Revelation. So again, a beautiful, beautiful picture of the first coming and second coming of our Lord and Savior. So in these trumpet calls, Isaiah 58, the Lord tells Isaiah the prophet, lift up your voice like a trumpet. 
Lord says to Jeremiah, I've made you a prophet and a trumpet. Lord says to Ezekiel that he's his trumpet. And John in the book of Revelations, when our Lord and Savior Jesus is speaking, he says that he heard a voice as a trumpet. So the trumpets are the, uh, the prophetic utterances of God to his people, literally proclaiming what he is getting ready to do. So the whole book of Revelations is things that are unveiling, things in our time and our season that God is, is releasing and we need to be part of that release and understand what God's called each and every one of us to do. So again, early rain, first coming, latter rain, second coming. Hallelujah. Deuteronomy 32, let my revelation fall as the rain. So what is rain symbolic of? It's a metaphor of revelation falling on us. So James chapter 4, James hears the voice. Hallelujah. He talks about Jesus coming back as the former and latter rains. First coming feast, second coming feast. And we are in the time frame. We are there within that time frame for the second coming feast. It's interesting that in Jewish eschatology, the Jews, the rabbis teach that everything has to happen before 6,000 years of biblical history. And we know there was 2,000 years or 4,000 years from Adam till the coming of Messiah Yeshua and another 2,000 years from then, to, uh, then till now. So 4 plus 2 is 6,000 years. So we are right in the frame. We are right in the picture frame of this massive release of the glory of God. And we need to understand that everything that is unfolding in this season is about his glory being revealed in the earth. And, and we have not really seen this glory manifest. We have operated the last 2,000 years, according to Scripture, under the anointing of God. We, we have been the menorah. We have been the lamp filled with oil. But now the Lord wants to transition this from the oil to the glory. And so this glory realm that the Lord is getting ready to release is going to be an incredible, incredible manifestation of power that we have never seen before. This glory of God is the, the literal appearing of God in the earth. That's interesting. The rabbis also teach that when God has turned his face from humanity, that humanity doesn't believe that God exists. And for the most part, we look at the world today, the majority of the world does not believe that God exists, even a lot of Christians. It's a shame to say very few Christians actually believe in the scripture. They, they, very few believe in the divinity of Jesus. Very few believe in the, in the, in the uh, uh, birth of Jesus from a virgin, the virgin birth. Uh, there's a lot of things in the, in the scriptures that are talking about supernatural things, that it's a shame most Christians don't believe that. But we are getting ready to see something that's going to go far beyond anything that we've ever read in the Scripture. As a matter of fact, the rabbis also teach that when God turns his face towards his people, that the whole world know, will know that he is real. And the last time that they said that that happened was when God took his people out of Egypt. And, and clearly... The Exodus is a picture also of end time, uh, end time things. When we look uh, at, again, Jewish eschatology, it teaches about the greater Exodus. That's God taking man out of his, uh, out of, out of his, uh, uh, his sin, out of his bondage to sin, and out of the things of this world. Literally, the Jews believe that eventually Messiah will come and redeem the whole earth, and, and that's what we believe. But what we're getting ready to see is something far greater. Because when God turned his face to Moses, literally because he turned his face to Moses, everyone and everything that was in the Middle East, all the ites, all those that were part of this uh, massive uh, uh, exodus out of Egypt, even Pharaoh himself believed that Yahweh was real. And eventually, God is going to bring us to the point that we and the whole world will know that he is real because he wants to bring that revelation of himself forward. But he's looking for a company of people, the manifestation of the sons of God, Joel's army, Ezekiel's army, uh, uh, the Moses company, hallelujah, uh, Gideon's army. There's so many names for this army that he's getting ready to release, this army of light, this army of revelators that will capture the whole world, and, and literally reveal the glory of God in the earth. 
You know, it's an incredible thing to me. I used to watch uh, the movie The Ten Commandments and with, with Charlton Heston. And I, I, I could never understand, you know, the story in the Bible where Pharaoh literally followed the uh, Jewish people, the, the Hebrews, into the Red Sea. How could a man over and over and over with the plagues that were being released and all these things that God was doing to Egypt, how couldn't he submit himself to Yahweh? But a lot of people don't realize that Pharaoh also believed he was a god. And a lot of the Egyptians believed they were descendants of the god. And if you go back, the Egyptian culture was created out of the Phoenician uh, culture. The Phoenicians started the Egyptian empire. But the Phoenicians... Were the, were the very ones that the fallen angels came down and started a hybriding with people in the earth. So we know that out of nowhere this Phoenician culture comes and these people have an incredible advanced mathematics, uh, uh, engineering capabilities that is not seen anywhere. And they literally take that technology, they literally take their, their theologies and they, and they pass it to the Egyptians and again, these Egyptians, I believe they were hybrids. They were part of this company called the Anunnaki or the Nephilim that were the hybrids or the descendants of these fallen angels. And see, that gives us a very clear picture of why God, when he told Joshua you know, to take his people into the promised land, that he said, wipe everything out. Because literally, the promised land was infested with these fallen beings. And the Lord just said, just take care of everything. Don't let anything live. But we have to understand that today, the time and the season that we are coming into, we are going to come into an incredible season of spiritual battle, an incredible season of spiritual attack. But within that, we're going to see some things released that are going to be phenomenal as far as the church is concerned. Literally, we've already been seeing uh, miracles and signs and wonders. Uh, the other night at our meeting, I was just preaching about having eyes to see and ears to hear, and a lady that was in the meeting uh, literally got her ear uh, hearing back just as she, you know, she jumped up and she was going, I can hear, I can hear. Uh, literally just one miracle after another. Sunday was an incredible testimony. Two people, literally within uh, three testimonies in the last week, three people were brought back from the dead just within our congregation. God supernaturally moved and three different incidences, and, and literally brought life back. And I, I can clearly see that we are moving into something that, that we have not seen in the church yet. You know, growing up under Mrs. Coleman, uh, she would talk about a day coming that literally everybody, everybody in the meetings will be healed. And I can see we're getting very close to that, just because a lot of the things I have watched happening in the earth, we just... Not too long ago, last month, we were in Korea, a month and a half ago. While I was in Korea, very interesting thing. Uh, one of the churches, a major church there, uh, members of about 15,000, we had prayer, you know, after uh, one of the afternoon meetings. Literally, everybody in that meeting was healed. Went to another church. Everybody was healed in that meeting except for one person. So I know we're really stepping into a, a season for the miraculous to be released in a, in a phenomenal way. And I'm really looking forward to stepping into meetings where not only are the blind healed and the deaf healed, but watching children grow arms and grow legs and those type of miracles. Things that I've cried out to God for, things that I fasted for and asked the Lord that that, that season would come. But I know when we start talking about those type of miracles. See, miracles are one thing. Creative miracles are a whole other thing. When we go back and we look at the exodus of the Jews coming out of Egypt, we know that there was the plagues that were being released. And the, and the magicians of Pharaoh would copy what Moses was doing. But there was one plague that the magicians said, we can't do this. We cannot mimic this miracle. This is the finger of God. And the reason that it was the finger of God, and, and that term is used in the scripture, is because Lice were released into the earth, but it wasn't a, just a lice plague. Prior to that, if you read what happened in the Hebrew, Moses created lice by his speech. 
meaning before Moses released lice on the earth, there was never lice ever created anywhere. This was a creative miracle that manifested itself out of the glory realm of God. And even these fallen angels, these, these uh, uh, Egyptian gods, they said, this is a miracle that we can't copy. This is something that we just can't do. And understanding that, this is what's getting ready to happen. Nothing in this earth, no medical organization, no doctors, no scientists, are going to be able to mimic this realm of the glory. It's going to be so far out by itself. It's going to be so incredible of what God is getting ready to do. And when he releases this thing, it's just not going to be, you know, a progressive release. It's just going to happen like that. All of a sudden, the glory of God is going to hit. And when it hits, it's going to shake the whole world up. The newscasters, everybody is going to want to see and be part and listen to and, and, and videotape this miraculous season that is coming to the church. And saints, we are about to see 2013 is going to be a year for the release of this glory. This year, we will begin to see this glory train begin to move. And when it starts, there's not going to be any stopping it. It's just going to manifest. It's going to grow and grow and grow to the point that God is going to pull everything back into the garden. He's going to pull everything back into the Holy of Holies. He's going to pour it, pull everything back into the realm of his glory. Malachi chapter 4 says this, For behold, the day cometh, and it shall burn like an oven. And all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly shall be stubble. And that day cometh, shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall neither leave them root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go out and grow fat like stall-fed calves. Meaning when this move is released, it's going to be a release of the fire of God. And when this fire comes and hits us, this fire of revelation is going to cleanse everything in the earth. That's individuals, that's those of us that are in the church, that's even the earth itself. It's going to purify everything because fire to the ancients was, a, was used to fertilize and was used to clean, to use to burn off things that, uh, for fields that they wanted to plant, harvest in. So to them, it was a modern-day fertilizer. But to us today, it's going to be the release of the revelation of the kingdom of God and the revelation of his son Jesus. And God's going to plant that message in our hearts to the point that you and I are going to know Jesus unlike any other generation. That's why the book of Revelation says, Hallelujah. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is the manifestation of the realm of his glory. And, and I know a lot of us are in churches that are still talking the anointing, the anointing, and the anointing. But this is a whole other realm. You know, in the anointing, that's the baptism of the Spirit. But we are getting ready to come into the glory, which is the baptism of fire. God is going to release that fire on us, unlike anything that we've ever seen, been part of, that's why Jesus calls it the greater works ministries. He talks about the end of the age, and he said, you shall do greater things. And those greater things are the greater works ministries, the ministries that will move in the glory. It, it is going to be like night and day. It's going to be like when the church separated from Judaism. It was a whole new release. It was a whole new season. It's going to be like when the Jews broke away from Egypt. It's going to be a whole new move. It's going to be completely different. Nothing is going to look the same as it looks now. Everything is going to go through that change, transition, that manifestation of the realm of his glory because this has been on his heart. Hallelujah. Ever since Adam fell in the garden, the Lord has wanted to restore us back to what was lost. You and I are a part of an incredible time, saints. It's a time that really we need to get serious about the Lord. We really need to get serious and ask him to show us what he wants for our lives because our lives are just not... Well, I receive Jesus, and I include Jesus into my life. That's not what this is about. The scripture is very clear. Jesus said, when you receive me, your life isn't your own anymore. Meaning whatever he wants from us, whatever he wants us to do, that is what we are called to do. Our life is not our own. And we really need to pray and say, Dad, you know, Lord, what do you want me to do? Where do you want me in my life? What, what do you want from me? And I'm sure there's many of you out there 
that you're out of place. You're not where the Lord's calling you. You know, for years I ran from, from what God called me to do. I was doing other things. I was in the business realm, and I thought, well, that's what God called me to do, but that really wasn't it. But until I got into that, into that flow, until I got into the river of God, and I began to flow with what God wanted me to do and, and move into what God wanted me to do, then everything in my life, everything just began to fall into place. Everything just began to flow in his plans and his purpose. I've been over 50 nations, actually probably closer to 60 nations. I've seen God do things, incredible things all over the earth. I've, I've watched God provide hotels, uh, trains, planes, automobiles. I've watched him supply all my needs. Uh, I've seen him do things that, you know, a lot of us would be afraid to step out and trust him in those things. But every time I've ever stepped out and trusted him, hallelujah, he has met my need. He's always met it. If that's you, you need to make that step. And you just need to pray this prayer after me and say, Lord, I just ask you to come into my life. I ask you to fill me with this anointing that Pastor Mike is talking about. Transform me. Don't leave me the same. I give you everything. I give you my life. I give you my family. I give you my job. I give you everything. Everything is yours. And I ask you to cover me in the blood of Jesus. I ask for Jesus to come into my heart and save me from my old ways. If you've prayed that prayer, if you've asked Jesus to come into your heart, all you need to do is call that number at the bottom of your screen, send us an email, uh, send an email in to, to uh, Forerunner Ministries. Let us know that you receive Jesus into your heart as your Lord and your Savior. Saying that, please support the station. God is doing wonderful things here, and we're getting ready to see some incredible testimonies come out of the way television. May God bless you abundantly. Hallelujah.